Hey, oh. Where are you going? Tell Sansa her sister's home. The inspiration for the scene was Odysseus returning after his long wanderings. No one recognizes him. You see her looking at Winterfell from that vantage point on the hill. I would hope that it stirs some emotion in you that this girl who's been through what she's been through and experienced many of the insane and awful things she's experienced and come out the other side uh, stronger for it is finally coming home. But the second she comes home, she realizes that it's not the same place. It's a lot of homecomings in this season. I think the crucial thing here is the reunion with Sansa. In some ways, they're very similar to who they were, except more so. You know, Sansa always wanted to be a lady. Arya always kind of wanted to be a fighter. In other ways, they're so different than they were when they last saw each other. Both of them have had difficult journeys and difficult in their own ways. I think they come to respect the other in terms of how they've grown as people, but at the same time, that doesn't diminish the tension between them. John left you in charge. He did. By the end of that scene, they finally get to a place where there's a connection that's more genuine. And the idea with the scene was we wanted to lay in the beginnings of the storyline where Sansa realizes what Arya is now. Your list of people I'm going to kill. Sansa doesn't really know much about where Arya's gone and what she's done since they last saw each other. This scene, more than anything else, tells her what she's been up to. And the fact is, Brienne is a pretty legendary swordswoman, and it looks like Arya maybe beat her. I mean, Sansa's watching it, and she's not quite sure is Brienne holding back. Arya's really good at killing people. That's a bit worrisome. Who taught you how to do that? No one. The idea that this is like one of those French caves where prehistoric man lived and painted on the walls, except in our case, it wasn't prehistoric man, but children of the forest. It's supposed to be something that's very evocative of the thousands of years that have passed since these caves were first explored and the paintings were first made, and also obviously something that's quite relevant to the current storyline because it's about how these two disparate peoples united to fight the common enemy. There are a number of symbols on the wall. Some of them are supposed to remind us of patterns we've seen before. Going back to the very first geometric pattern on the show, which was the weird array of body parts that the White Walkers made, one of the things we learned from these cave paintings is that the White Walkers didn't come up with those images. They derived them from their creators, the children of the forest. These are patterns that have mystical significance for the children of the forest. We're not sure exactly what they signify, but spiral patterns are important in a lot of different cultures in our world and it makes sense that they would be in this world as well. The enemy is real. It's always been real. There's tension on two sides. One is the political, where Jon Snow has his own very specific purpose here on Dragonstone, and that's to get the dragon glass, and if possible, to convince Danny to fight with him. And Danny has her own very specific purpose, which is to get Jon to bend the knee. There's conflict, and it's conflict between powerful people. And then to make it all even more complicated, they're starting to be attracted to each other. And so much of it is not from dialogue or anything we wrote. It's just the two of them in a small space standing near each other and us just watching that and feeling the heat of that. What is it? We took Costly Rock. That's very good to hear, isn't it? She had a nicely triumphant return to Dragonstone, which nobody contested or got in the way of. From that point on, she's lost two of her principal allies. She's lost a lot of her fleet. She's in a position where if she doesn't step up soon and come up with a big win for her side, she's going to lose this fight before it even begins. I think she really feels the pressure of her situation more than she ever has before. It's the fight she's been waiting for her whole life. I think there are several stories interplaying here. Part of it is that Danny's finally cutting loose. The whole first part of the season, she's been frustrated. In following Tyrion's counsel, she's been fighting with one hand behind her back, and so she hasn't really unleashed the Dothraki horde. She hasn't really set the dragons into combat yet. With the Lutran battle, one of the things that's most exciting about it for us, this is the first time we've ever had two sets of main characters on opposite sides of the battlefield. And it's impossible to really want any one of them to win and impossible to want any one of them to lose. We can hold them off. This dragon flies up. That makes it a totally different situation. It's almost like what if somebody had an F-16 that they brought to a medieval battle. You start to scrap the history of it a bit and just think about how would those things interact with each other in a way that's exciting and believable to the extent that dragons are believable. 
Kyburn realized that the dragons were vulnerable. They might be fearsome beasts, but they are mortal and they can be hurt and they can be killed. So we see the scorpion come into play, manned by Bronn. And we see Drogon wounded. Things turn out okay for them, but I think it also changes the calculation a little bit because now they know these weapons are on the board. This ongoing war with Cersei is entering into uh, dangerous territory. Jamie's charge at Daenerys is a hard thing to top for me in that sequence only because when you have a, a principal character trying to murder another principal character, that doesn't happen all that often.